So my friends, this morning we're thinking about what it means to live a God-centered life. And I asked you in the opening to think about those different pieces in your life and how those fit together and what is it that's at the center. Um, you know, uh, we're at a time of year where for uh, maybe a majority of Americans, the, the thing that, that we really think about when it comes to Sunday is not so much what happens on Sunday morning, but what happens on Sunday afternoon. And uh, that's, for me, one small example of something that maybe makes a more central place in our life than God does. Of course, I'm talking about football. Who doesn't love football? Um, okay, not everybody, but a lot of us do. So, and, and God loves Bears fans just as much as God loves Packer fans. So there we go. All right. Um, but friends, uh, this idea of a God-centered life, where we're going today is all the way back to the Moses story. As Moses is leading the Israelites um, from those years of captivity into freedom, um, you may remember that one of the first things that happened when they left Egypt, uh, they went to Mount Sinai, and Moses got the Ten Commandments. Uh, and if you don't know, actually the Ten Commandments show up in Scripture twice. The first time is when they first get to Mount Sinai there. The second time is 40 years later, uh, when they're preparing to enter the promised land. And at that time, which is where we're going to be today, Moses uh, says, hey, remember when this happened 40 years ago? I want to remind you about the covenant that we made with God. And so uh, today is about this covenant that, first of all, God made with the Jewish people, but also this covenant that God makes with us, which uh, as Lutherans is centered in baptism is where that starts. And confirmation is another expression, a reminder of what that covenant is all about. But a covenant is a, a, a sort of an agreement. And in theological terms, it's an agreement between people and God. And, and, it's, and, a, and this particular covenant is all about God saying, listen, I chose you. You're my people. I've saved you. I've claimed you. You're mine. Now, to be my people, this is how I want you to live. And the way that we're called to live, first and foremost, is by putting God at the center of our lives, ordering our lives around Jesus. Now, Moses lays that out, or God lays that out in the very simple Ten Commandments that many of us grew up learning or knowing, and we have some idea of what those are, and we'll actually read those today. But what I want to say from the outset is it's not so much about, hey, here's a list of ten to check off and make sure you're a good person. That's not the idea here. This isn't about a checklist. This is about a way of life. And as Jesus will say later when he's asked, hey, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? Jesus says, well, it's really two. He says, the first one is love God with all that you are, and the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. And so bottom line, when we boil all this down today, that's really what's at the heart of it. We put, when we put God at the center of our lives and we, we love God with all that we are, we also then, in living in response, we also then love our neighbors with that same kind of love. And that's the very basic central focus of what all this is about, putting God at the center and then sharing God's love with the world. So there's a little background there. Now, as we come into the reading today, um, before we get to the Ten Commandment part, uh, there's something that's called the Shema. And the Shema is a, a very important part of Scripture to the Jewish people. In fact, um, many use it as a part of their daily prayers. And the reason it's called the Shema is because Shema is the first word of this passage in Hebrew. And the word Shema means listen. And it's like a, hey, pay attention. But it's not just to pay attention. What it means by listening is don't just hear it, but actually listen in such a way that then you obey. Okay, so in other words, you haven't actually heard it if you don't live it out. Does that make sense? Okay, don't just, don't just sit there quietly while the words go by. Take them in and live them out. And so um, for many Jewish folks, this part of the passage is part of their daily prayer life and reminds them of how they center God at the center of everything. So we're going to start there this morning, and then we'll go through the Ten Commandments. But let's hear um, what the Shema says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this is Moses um, speaking to the people. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We'll pause there. 
So you hear this call to put God at the center and not just with lip service, but actually to be intentional in living our faith day in, day out throughout the day. And, and a big part of what he's saying here is this isn't just for you, but it's for those who come after you. And, and a central part of the faith and part of what Ben and Kaylee will be promising with Ivy Joe's baptism today is to say, and we're going to pass this on to our child. This gets passed to our children. This gets passed on to those who come after us. This is central to what it means to be a people of faith. It's not something that I just keep to myself. It's something that I intentionally pass on. Now, as we think about this idea of faith being central, I think this, a real struggle in our culture is that for a long time, we've really kind of ingrained in ourselves a certain way of thinking about faith, and that is that what it means to be a person of faith is I go to worship once a week, and maybe I say a, a bedtime prayer, or maybe I say a meal prayer, but Faith and God kind of fit in a little box that's one little box in my life, and that box kind of gets put away when I'm doing everything else, right? Unfortunately, that's kind of the way that we've taught things. And so even though, you know, um, for generations we'd bring kids to Sunday school, we'd baptize them, we'd confirm them, because God and faith wasn't integrated into everything in daily life, God just kind of gets left on the shelf. We put God in the box and leave him there. Okay, and not, not, un, not intentionally, but that's what happens. When we don't infuse faith into daily living, then there's not a space in our framework of the world to make sense of how God fits, right? And so most of our children grow up and they go, I don't know where God fits in this because when I'm at school, I can't talk about God. And at home, my parents don't really talk about God. It's just, you know, this thing we do once a week, maybe, and of course today, um, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, regular church attendance is kind of like every third week. That's kind of the average normal now for Americans. So you, it's no surprise then that more and more Americans are saying, yeah, this God thing, I don't know where it fits in my life. We're just going to leave it over here. Okay? So you get the basic idea here. And, and essentially what Moses is saying, what God is saying here is, if God really is who God says, if we really believe and trust in this God, then God should be at a central place in our life. And then that should impact and affect the way that we live. And it means that we live with a different kind of intentionality, that we don't, we don't just show up to check a box, but that faith is integral to the choices we make day in, day out, and how we interact with others and how we ultimately how we love them. So let's just hear um, some of those pieces here. He says, so first of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. Now, many of you are going to recognize this. This is the passage that Jesus quotes later when he's asked, what's the most important commandment? He's quoting right here from Deuteronomy. But then listen to these pieces that Moses says. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands. Repeat them again and again. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead. That seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. He's saying, we got to live into this all the time. We live into it. We don't give it lip service. We're not just checking a box, but it means something. It means something. Now, of course, um, when we fast forward to when Jesus was alive, this, Jesus' biggest beef was the really religious people in Jesus' time, the Pharisees. They were experts at checking the boxes and going, see, we checked all the boxes. Look how good we are. And Jesus would say to them, you guys are idiots. It's not about checking boxes. It's about your heart. You got to live it. You're not just checking boxes here, guys. And isn't this part of the, um, I think, the problem that so many of us have in general with religion in this country, right? Our, our impression is, man, it's just a bunch of people, um, more or less hypocrites. Like they say they believe it, but come on. And of course, we don't do this perfectly, do we? None of us do. But I hope in this place we're, we're, we're past that place of trying to like put on airs or pretend that we've got it all together or somehow we're better than anybody else. But the reminder here is that we're trying. We're trying to put God at the center. We're intentionally taking time to speak with Jesus each day. We're making efforts to share our faith with our children and our grandchildren and our friends. Not because we have it all figured out, but because God's really important to us and we want to share God's love with others. Okay, let's maybe go on to the next section here uh, as then Moses is talking to the people and he's telling them what's happening next. So um, a reminder of what's happened. So we left off the story with um, Moses in the burning bush 
Uh, this was three weeks ago. And, uh, and God said, hey, Moses, I want you to go set my people free. And Moses said, no way, Jose, I'm not the guy for that job. I can't do it. And do you remember the reminder from God was, I will be with you. And the reminder was to say, listen, it doesn't matter what you think you can or can't do. If God calls you, God is with you. All things are possible when God is with us. And that was that reminder to Moses that, listen, I, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker you are or aren't. I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to be with you. So Moses did then go and challenge Pharaoh. The people were brought out of slavery. And then if you remember, after he first got the Ten Commandments, he came down the mountain. And do you remember what the community of Israelites were doing um, when he came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments? They, they weren't just making an idol. They, were, they had made an idol, and they were worshiping it, right? So they had piled together all their like gold earrings and stuff, and they had, they had made this golden calf statue. Um, now, if you... Near Eastern religions at the time, that was a common thing. Um, okay, so anyway, so they're thinking, now we've got a God. We made the statue. We can worship it. It's going to be great. Moses comes in and says, people, what, what do you think just happened here? God just saved you, and now you're worshiping this golden statue? What's wrong with you? And um, that set in, a whole, in, of course, a whole chain of events where then the Israelites didn't go right to the promised land. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, Okay. So at that time, God said, listen, here's the deal, folks. Because you already like turned your back on me, um, we're going to have to wait for a whole new generation to come along here. So when we fast forward to where we are today, there's basically been a whole turnover in the people of Israel. A whole generation has come and gone. It's a new generation that now um, is in adulthood and ready to move into the promised land. And so now when we read the Ten Commandments here, Moses is saying, listen, this happened before. But those words that were for your ancestors, they actually, they're for you. So let's remember this and take this with us and put God at the center. So here we go. Moses called all the people of Israel together and he said, listen carefully, Israel. Hear the decrees and regulations I'm giving you today so you may learn them and obey them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Mount Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with our ancestors, but with all of us who are alive today. At the mountain, the Lord spoke to you face to face from the heart of the fire. I stood as an intermediary between you and the Lord, for you were afraid of the fire and didn't want to approach the mountain. He spoke to me, and I passed his words on to you. So here we have the covenant language. God, um, this is the promise that God made with all of you. Now, it's so interesting, as I said before, um, a whole generation had come and gone, but Moses said, listen, no, this is for you people. This is with you. It wasn't just them, it's you. And the intent is for us today as we hear these words to say, and this is for me too. This is for us today. We're the ones who are to listen to this and hear this and obey this, okay? So going on, this is what he said. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children, and the entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. So a couple of things here. So we hear this interesting statement. He says, uh, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family's affected, even to the third and fourth generation. Now, for me, when I hear that, what I think about is, is the idea of generational sin. I mean, we all know in our own families and other families, those things that just keep cropping up their head, they get passed on from one generation to the next. Parents, we pass on, unfortunately, we pass on our bad habits to our children, right? That happens. And we see that... Um, when we turn our back on God, it has an effect on our family. It has an impact on our children. The way that we live matters, and we pass on these things. But what's, for me, so powerful here is the next verse. He says, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Now, do you see the big difference between three and four generations and a thousand generations? Okay, God wants us to know that 
there, there are real repercussions for the sin in our life. It impacts our family. The way that we live impacts the people around us. But he also wants us to know that if we love God, serve him, that also has an incredible impact on our family and the people around us. And God's love and mercy far outweighs the pain and struggle that we see. Now, I also want us to uh, think here for a moment uh, about this business of making an idol. Now, 2,000 years ago, well, actually, this is more more like 3,000 years ago, when, when this was happening, this kind of thing made sense. It doesn't make sense to us, right? They say, in this time, people had their own idols at home. They had things like little statues that they would pray in front of, that they would bow down to. And they had, they had all sorts of them, not just one God, but multiple gods that they would worship. And so one of the things that they're addressing here is to say, listen, there's only one God. His name is Yahweh, and you don't get to make a statue of him to worship. He's not a statue. God's way bigger than that. So we hear that in our modern mind, and we go, well, yeah, duh, right? Like we hear that, and that just seems kind of silly that anybody would, would have a little statue that they worship. It's a lot more, I think, difficult in our culture today because we actually have all sorts of gods that we worship. We just don't, it's just not so obvious. We don't have a little altar where we put our little statue that we get down and bow in front of. Instead, on Sunday afternoon, we'll sit on the couch and we'll bow down to our idol on the TV screen, right? By the way, I love football, so uh, <laughs> I'm just using that as a simple example. Like, like, I don't know about you, but I used to have like five fantasy teams at a time. It was nuts. And then I could never get enough of it, right? So all week long, I'm thinking about who am I playing this week? How, what's that going to look like? Hours and hours and hours. If you're in that place, just something to think about, <laughs> right? Okay. All right. So what's at the center of our lives? What are our idols? What are we worshiping? Is, it, is our job the God in our life? Is it a relationship that's the God in our life? Is it an addiction that's the God of our life? Is it money that's the God of our life? Is it our favorite sports team that's the God of our life? What are the things that you put in the place of God? You may not bow down on your knees and worship it, but if we're to get real honest, that's where your heart lies, right? That's the challenge here that we're being called to take account for. Just to look at ourselves and say, do I need to make some adjustments here? Do I need to rethink what I, what I prioritize? And ultimately, then, what we need to understand is this impacts the generations that come after us because the people around us see where our priorities are and what we put first, and they're taking notes. And if there's not really any room for God, if God's just over here, there's no reason to expect that that would be any different for those that come after us, Okay. Okay, so those first, that first little bit is about where God fits in our lives. There's a couple more that do the same thing, so let's look at these next verses. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you and your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God's commanded you to rest on the Sabbath. Friends, in in general, this reminder about Sabbath is just to say, we also need to rest. And And oftentimes, resting allows us to put things in the proper place. Resting allows us to make space in our hearts and minds for God to speak to us, for God to be put in God's right place. And if we don't ever take time to stop, it's awfully hard to have any room to listen for God speaking. We need to take time to stop. We need to stop. I, uh, one thing I want to just say around that, that uh, a friend of mine talks about this, I really appreciate. You know, we think of our time of, away from work as time for recreation. And another, way, another word to say recreation is recreation. And I want to challenge you to think about your recreation. Is that a time for recreating, for new life in you? Or do you find yourself with your recreation coming back more tired than when you left? Right? Another way to think about recreation. Does this give me life? Does this draw me closer to God? Uh, am, Am I taking time to recreate in a way that I'm recreating? 
Okay. We need to keep moving. So last li- this next part, we're just going to zoom through. Um, these first part of the Ten Commandments, it's about God and where God fits in your life. Now we turn to everybody else. How do we treat others? So God says in verse 16, Honor your father and mother as the Lord commanded you. Then you will live a long, full life in the land your, the Lord your God is giving you. Note, that's the only commandment that comes with a promise. Love your parents, and if you do, you'll live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Interesting. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's wife. You must not covet your neighbor's house or land or servant or ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Whew, that's the end of the reading. There it is. So, um, Anybody ever uh, looked at something someone else has and thought, really thought, I'd really like to have that? Okay, we're on that boat. You know, we get a, we get a checklist like this, and again, it's easy for us to say, well, never murdered anybody. Yep, I'm doing a great job. Look at me. Do you know what Jesus said about murder? He said, if you've ever hated someone, you've committed murder. Okay, he said, if you've ever lusted after someone, had a lustful thought, you've committed adultery. Now, Jesus' point wasn't to say, do you see how bad you are? His point was to say, there's no one who can stand righteously and say, look how good I am. I've never done that. I've never... We don't have time for that. Jesus isn't interested in that. The point isn't, how good are you? What Jesus wants us to recognize is that none of us stand on our own righteousness, but that doesn't stop God from loving us and forgiving us, right? Jesus' problem was with the religious people in his day who stood back and thought they were better than everybody else. We don't have time for that nonsense here, right? Jesus is, what Jesus wanted the people to know was, listen, faith is simple. Love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Put God at the center and God's love will infiltrate the rest of your life. When God's love fills you and seeps out from you, that's when the world gets changed. That's when your family gets changed. That's when your workplace gets changed. That's when your community gets changed. That's when the world gets changed. When God's love fills us and we share it with the world. That's what it's all about. But friends, I can't do that on my own strength. And I can't do it by just working harder to be a better person. It starts by putting God at the center and saying, God, help me. I need your help. Help me. Help me, God. That's where it starts. And when I daily come before God and say, God, I need your help today because I know I'm going to get impatient with somebody. I know I'm going to get frustrated with somebody. I know I'm going to have this thing distracting me and that thing distracting me and I'm, I'm going to just get caught up in all the things going on. I need your help today. Help me to be who you created me to be. That's the vision for life that Moses is giving to the Israelites as they move into the promised land. He's saying, you now have a whole new abundant life waiting for you. But if you want it to really be what it's intended to be, you need to put God at the center. Start there. And then God's love will change everything around you. I want to read one last time this morning the Shema uh, that we started with today. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Friends, may we put God at the center of our lives. And as we do so, May we allow God to change us so that his love is shared with the world. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, today um, we're challenged to think about where you're at in our lives and how far off to the side we push you most of the time. God, challenge us today in the ways that we need to be challenged to know what things need to be shift it out of the center so that there's more room for you there. God, help us to come to you today, to look to you, to trust you with what's in front of us. And help us to be more intentional about sharing you with our family, with our friends. Help us to be more intentional allowing your love 
to not only change us, but to work through us. Help us to be a people who never self-righteous, but instead, Lord, in humility and grace, do our best to love. Thank you for claiming us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us. And thank you for sending us to be your presence in this world. May we keep you at the center. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.